Welcome to Conversations with Friends. This is episode four. I'm Bob the Orc, and tonight we are going to talk about the musical journey with Richard Danley. Richard Danley is a performer who's, who's uh, played music and sang all over the world, and I met him through my mom when I was very young. And uh, we're going to talk about, about music, and uh, we're going to maybe, uh, maybe play some tunes, and we're going to have a good old time. So, Richard, welcome. Welcome to the Internet. Thank you very much, Mark. So, uh, so how, how, did you, how did you get – I know how you met my mom, but let, let's start with how you met my mom, and, and then we can get into how you, how you got into music in, in general. So how did, how, you and mom met on that cruise ship, right? Yes, in 1993, to be specific. <laughs> That's really dating yourself. That's a long time ago, yeah. <laughs> 28 years ago. I, I, I had to just shake my head and say, my goodness, was it that long ago? I think it was. Uh, uh, 93. That would be 28, yeah. And it was actually this month. Yeah. Because I left in January, about January, middle of January, and was gone until the end of May. But the point is, it was a world cruise uh, on the Rotterdam, uh, Holland America Rotterdam. And I was hired, literally, uh, or actually... Hall in America hired the Peter Duchin Entertainment Organization, so I was representing uh, Peter Duchin. I had done some work for them locally, a number of things, gigs and whatever. Right. And so uh, this is an interesting story by itself because the agent who was who I'd met, and I knew knew the guy, uh, Bernie was his name, and so we had this meeting, and he uh, says, um, uh, Peter would like for you to go uh, do a world cruise. I said, really? I said, yeah. We they the the company. Holland America wanted to hire them to do society music. And society music, for anybody who doesn't know, is the older music. We're talking about music of the 1920s, 30s, and so forth. And uh, Could you give you know, us an so example of that a little bit later? Or? Sure. There okay. was Cole Porter, Gershwin, things like this, yeah. and that was my forte anyway. So, uh, But the interesting thing was in that interview, uh, the, one of the first things I said, because I did, I, I did a, a short cruise to Alaska about four months earlier. Uh, just as a replacement for someone. So anyway, I said, well, that sounds great. And he said, how long is it going to be? He said, three and a half months. It's good. You're going to run around the world. I said, and so the, then I had this question. I said, okay, what's the average age of the passengers? Because I didn't really know. Yeah. And without skipping a beat, he looked right at me and said, death. <laughs> no kidding. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> I said, what? Oh. <laughs> And he said, well, you have to see, the average age is between 70 and 80. Well, in the 70s and 80s. Oh, no. And I said, oh, my goodness. <laughs> but, but sure enough, when I went, and it was three and a half months, um, and you, he was right because they were literally retired doctors and lawyers and very rich people, and they were very old people. And uh, They just wanted to have one last hurrah. Well, as it turns out, on that cruise, there were about six or seven people that did die on the cruise. No kidding. And uh, I remember this one sweet old lady. She used to come uh, – because I played in the, uh, our band, which had five-piece band. We played um, that music, like I say, all dance music, you know, very light dance music, lat, uh, jazz pieces, swing pieces, right. Latin waltzes, you know, the old, old stuff. And so – but this one lady used to, you know, come pretty much every night – we were in, I think it was Bali. I think that was one of our places. And, yeah. and we have these old temples with all these big, these long staircases, you know, very long, high staircases. And for her. And so she collapsed and they brought her back to the cruise ship and she died. And uh, what they do in the cases like that, they literally have to put them in, it's hard to say, but it's like cold storage. Until we get to the next port, where they then fly. Do they, the, so, uh, do they have like a, a like a freezer morgue on the ship, or do they? Not, well, not not specifically for that reason, but they it's happened. It's, this is not. The or first do they time or that... do they put them in the freezer with the rest of the frozen food? Because that'd be a little. Bit I weird. don't know. I don't think that. No. <laughs> but in any case, it was kind of sad because you know you knew these people. You know you got to meet them. And, and then one night nice. she doesn't show up. Uh yeah well the word gets around pretty fast on a cruise ship. But the nice thing about that cruise ship was, and this is a lead back into with your mom, is that it was a uh, not, it was a world cruise, like I said. It was a celebrity cruise. So these were people who were very famous, or at least famous back in the old days. Right. And uh, uh, names that I'm sure you probably don't even know as much, but uh, if you do a little Google search, you'll you'll instantly hear who they are. 
Right. Uh, one of the first ones I met was a man named Cab Call- Cab Calloway. I I've Cab- heard of him. I I've listened. He's a jazz guy. He was a jazz guy, mostly in popular like- in the 1930s. Yeah. His, no, I've listened. His, his, yeah. His big song was Minnie the Moocher. Yeah. He was in. He was in the Blues Brothers. Yes. Yeah. He was. He was. That's right. right. That's and where I know him the, from. Yeah, I love that guy. Right. The Blues Brothers was in the eighties. Yeah. I think the movie wait, was. wait, was he on that? Was he on that cruise? I talked to him for at length. Yeah. Holy crap! That's awesome. That was like I say. This cruise was in ninety three, and interestingly enough, he was on the cruise not as a performer. He and his wife got on in New York, and were actually just going to make the leg from uh, New York to Los Angeles which is where he basically was living. Did you go through and the so, Panama Canal or did you go all the way? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's, that's right. Panama Canal. Okay. He went through the Panama Canal. I wasn't but sure if he you went all the way down around the, the, the southern tip of South America. No, we didn't go that far. Okay. We only hit one country in South America, and that was Colombia. Okay. We went to Cartagena, right Colombia. So we went just barely in and then through the Panama to Los Angeles and we're to Mexico and Acapulco and all that. But what I was trying to say was that uh, the reason I was able to talk to Cab is I had a mutual contact, a man that uh, I worked with in New York, named Danny Holgate, who was uh, who had worked was actually Cab Calloway's music director for many years. Okay. And I had done separate work uh, through Danny as a music editor, and and actually I had sub for Danny at that cruise ship to Alaska. So I I knew Danny, and so when I told Danny that I was going to be doing the cru- cruise ship. And I said, that's great. Let me know how it goes. He had no idea the cab was on it. So when I went on the cruise ship and there's Cab Calloway, and I said, holy Toledo. <laughs> and because I knew who everybody knows in, in our yeah. business. E- even I know who he is, and I'm not that old. That's right. And so, but he and, the, he and his wife were on there just to, as passengers. They weren't on there as performers. He wasn't on there as a performer. But here's the interesting part. Um, I've, I had this lovely conversation with him. He was very personal. And one thing you find about cruise ships, by the way, with celebrities, mm-hmm. they're very much at ease. I mean, I was able to talk to many celebrities during that cruise, uh, people who were in Broadway and people who were movies and things like this. And they were very approachable because, see, on a cruise ship, there's no paparazzi. Right, following right. Them so it was very easy. And so – but what was interesting, I think it was the, the next day uh, – that cab and his wife were up in what they call the smoking lounge, which is kind of a bad name for it, I guess. But uh, and they had this Filipino uh, strolling strings, a couple of guitars, bass, violin, right. things like this. And they were entertaining, and he was up there. And apparently, and I wasn't there, but this is what the cruise director told me later. And he said that uh, cab started singing along with these guys, and it was just, <laughs> cats just were loving it. And so as... I'm repeating the story the cruise director told me. He says, uh, he said, Mr. Calloway, we would just be so tickled to death if you could do a couple of songs for the passengers tonight. Because there was another show going on right. with, the, with the Canadian Brass. And by the way, the Canadian Brass is a very famous group and, is, and it still exists to this day. Right. Anyway, uh, so they were scheduled to perform. And so he said, Mr. C- Mr. Calloway, would you do that? And he said, course i'm sure the ever the pro and so we all went to the show that night canadian brass and those i got to meet those guys too they were great and so i can't, i still remember to this day he gets up on stage and the audience just goes crazy cab calloway now cab already is probably 83 or something by this <laughs> yeah time. 83 for 84 whatever the google date says he is anyway and so he sings many the moocher and you know the it's pandemonium. And it was it yeah. was the right age crowd that they'd really appreciate that, too. Exactly, because they all knew who he was yeah. very easily, you know, the right age crowd. And he just it just locked, you know, the, it just knocked the walls down. And then we then then the final setup when they finished with that. And this is all improv. You have to yeah. bear in mind the Katie and Brass, they're just they had not rehearsed this. <laughs> yeah, this is not rehearsed. And then he goes into the Saints go marching in and just the audience is clever. That was one of the most thrilling moments in that cruise and that was in the beginning of the cruise uh, now was mom that, there at the time or is this before uh, she got she, on she, this is before she got on uh she got on when was that i think a month later okay forget what it was because she and the acting there were two different groups from symphony space 
that came on. And I, I'm trying to think, if I remember correctly, she may have gotten on in Los Angeles or right around that time. Okay. So it was about it was about the time that Cad got off. Okay. If and your dad may have the better uh, uh, information, but that was my recollection. That was 28 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> but in any case, uh, so anyway, but Cab was one of the many uh, celebrities, Leslie Uggams. I met Red Buttons and I met uh, uh, Phyllis Diller and people like that. Okay. So it's a, and uh, Marvin Hamlish and, and uh, uh, my goodness, Joel Gray and Neil Sedaka and, and these folks are still around. And so it was really fun. But so your mom came on with the group in Symphony Space. Uh, she was in the opera troupe, and there was another troupe that was an acting troupe, and they did separate performances. Right. And so that's how that kind of got started. And Because uh, mom those... wasn't originally going to do show tunes with you. That was kind of – you two no, kind of no, you kinda, you two kinda collaborated and yeah. we inspired were, yeah, that to was, do it. No, that was not planned. I just happened to – because I – because – in my band, the Duchin band that we represented, we played in this one big uh, room, the little ballroom thing, and the theater was literally just, you know, a few feet away. I mean, maybe like uh, only 15, 20 feet away. So we literally could not play our music while the show was going on. So every time there was a show scheduled, we had to stop so that, you know, and so because of that, we could see the shows. Which is great. Okay, yeah. And and so uh, and so I saw the you know her her troupe with her and they would sing Gilbert and Sullivan and they would do uh, different things from opera arias and things like this. I said, wow, you know. And so your mom and I just started talking a little bit and said, hey, and I just complimented the troupe and whatever. And so uh, she actually happened to see me play, and somehow the conversation came up about uh, you know. And I mentioned, well, I played opera and stuff in the past and classical. I have classical training. And so when we would have a break during the day, because generally we always had breaks during the day right. because the shows were always at night. And we just found a piano in one of the other rooms and so forth. And I would, we would see how much she knew. And she, she didn't really know that much um, Broadway music at the time. She knew some. So in a sense, your mom educated me a little bit about opera and things. And I educated her about some of the Broadway because Because when she came back from that cruise, she loved the hell out of Broadway music. I mean, she was really, she was really into that. Had she done, expressed much interest before the cruise? I, I don't, I don't know. Cause I didn't, we never really talked about it. I and mean, she didn't really do that. Uh, no, I don't think, I don't think she really did. But so I, I think, I, I think it's you know, probably your fault that she got into, you know, that, <laughs> that she, uh, you know, broadened her horizons. Probably because a lot of the worlds don't necessarily overlap. Now, there's some singers today. She always liked did. West Side Story, though. She really liked West Side Story. Well, and West Side Story, and you may recall that she and I actually did a video of, of uh, a medley from those yeah. songs. And West Side Story is very unique because it's written by Leonard Bernstein. And musically, it's, it's sort of operatic. Much, kind of operatic. Yeah. Uh, so that's a, that's a nice transition. Uh, that's that's why I'm sure she loved it because it was she could do her operatic style yeah. with things like West Side Story and so we worked out medleys and and I would teach her other things. Showboat was another one that we did and I think maybe we have a video of that somewhere. Uh, Showboat, which was a musical by Jerome Kern back in the 19, 1927, uh, by and that also was very operatic in nature. In fact, a lot of music back in that turn, that part of the um, century, was based on operettas. So right. as musical theater progressed into what we know today, which is very rock and all that, they, uh, it progressed to that point. But back in those days, you had to have really good voices. And then somebody like Ethel Merman came along. <laughs> yeah. And Ethel Merman was a belter and, you know, different yeah. style. Well, but yeah, but that was, that was what happened, is that we basically just kind of we kind of like would say, well, what do you know? What do you know? And I said, well, I know this, I know this. And we would, I would do Puccini because when I was in high school, I actually played for a couple of classmates who did opera, even though right. we were just high school. Uh, one of the first talent shows I played for, in was for a, a class. Well, I want to say classmate. She was a bandmate because she was actually in the year behind me, uh, sang uh, opera piece by Puccini, you know, Madame okay, Butterfly. Yeah, yeah. So I was already, in high school, I was already playing opera uh, pieces, so I was familiar with that. Yeah, Mom liked, Mom liked performing Madame Butterfly. That was, she, she liked that. Right, right. I right. think she liked La Traviata better, but... 
Yeah, she but, did. I think I think, I think that Latraviato's was more, more... her favorite. I think she, yeah, because Mo, she did a lot of Latraviata. She really liked Latraviata. Well, you know, and every a lot of people don't realize that there are different kinds of sopranos. Uh, yeah. Because there are the lyric sopranos, there are the coloratura sopranos, uh, which are very high. Uh, today, if you want to think of uh, coloraturas, you think of people like Kristen Chenoweth, who is a name that comes to mind to a lot yeah. of people, who actually had that training, but also was a very strong belter, a very different kind of voice. Um, but my point is that we would try to figure out what each of the other knew. And while we're there, and she was on, because the nature of the contracts on cruise, cruise ship performance, they're on anywhere between a week, sometimes longer. And if I remember, they, were, your mom and her troop were on for two weeks, if I'm not mistaken. Something, something like that. And again, your dad will kind of verify yeah. the length of time. But during that time, you know, so when we're not, when I'm not doing my gig and she wasn't doing her gig, we would find a piano during the day and we just she'd see, okay, what do you know? What do you know? What do you know? So. Well, why, why don't we, uh, why don't we play a couple of tunes? Because you were, you're talking about some of the, some of the older music that you're originally playing, uh, on on the uh, on the ship, and well, and then uh, let, let's hear a couple of things. The uh... Of course, like I say, on the cruise ship. And by the way, I was not only the leader of the group, but I was the singer. <laughs> right, right. A couple of the other guys did sing a little bit, but uh, not as much. So I, I used to do all the singing. So we would do Frank Sinatra and, and uh, music of Gershwin and Cole Porter. And these I are love Gershwin. names that go way, way back. And uh, so in situations like that, like a Cole Porter, I used to do a lot of Cole Porter. Frank Sinatra was my big thing. So... I've got you under my skin. I've got you deep in the heart of me. So deep in my heart, you're really a part of me. I've got you, got you under my skin. And night and day, you are the And under the sun, whether near to you or far, it doesn't matter where you are, I think of you. Night and day. Of course, most of those were Cole Porter. Yeah. Uh, and in the case of Gershwin... very clear our love is here to stay last song he wrote yeah. together we're going a long long way in time the rockies may crumble the Gibraltar may tumble they're only made of play but our love is here to stay a quick little medley of a couple of those things but we used to do songs like that we do the latins and the waltzes and uh, all the customers like it because that's the music that they grew up in right right and so that was what what was so common about that so how how did you how did you get started in, in music because you've been doing this since you were a kid right i mean you you grew up around music my well i started piano lessons when i was was eight you know, right which is kind of typical that's a fairly common age and as usual, I had several years of classical about the time I was 13, something like that. Um, I shifted to a school of music that's met on Saturdays. Uh, it, it was a Saturday program. So I still continue with the classical. I had a half hour classical, half hour of music theory, and a half hour of jazz. So by that time, I was starting to learn a little about jazz technique at the age of 13 right? and continue that on. And what was interesting, fascinating, my teacher was very smart. <laughs> it was very tricky okay. because I was playing all the classical music, which was fine. And he said, okay, I want, want to do, introduce you to a piece called Rhapsody in Blue. I love that song. George Gershwin. 
Now, of course, it's in the classical repertoire, even though it's written by a jazz composer. Right. And we can talk all day about how he got his start. But so anyway, the reason I said my teacher was sneaky <laughs> is because he introduced that to me and then said, okay, now um, I have a jazz teacher I want you to take lessons from. So oh, really? So one of the first things the jazz teacher had me do is do some of the jazz, uh, do some of the popular songs written by Gershwin. So to this day, I wish I had time to get it in, in my um, bookshelf, is a book that I got when I was... 13 or 14 years old, Gershwin popular songs. Yeah, because because George because uh, Rhapsody in Blue is how I was introduced to uh, to jazz by my grandmother. Because right. I you know I loved classical music growing up, and and then I heard Rhapsody in Blue. I was like, oh my god, what is this? I need more of it. Yeah. And, well, and, and then that, yeah, and so that's so I so I learned jazz basically through Gershwin originally, and I learned about chords and chord construction and right. rhythms and things of that nature. And by the time I was 17, my senior year in high school, I had already been working in Rhapsody Blue for quite a while. And so... Uh, all yeah, that's the a hard song. I can never... I was never good enough to play it. All the... <laughs> well, it's not easy. <laughs> no. But by the time I was... Actually, maybe I didn't start Rhapsody until 14. It, it, that's probably about right. <laughs> uh, but in any case, by the, when I was uh, a senior in high school... Uh, at my high school, that was in Virginia, by the way. I was born in Washington, D.C., right. but I uh, lived in the Virginia suburbs. Uh, Springfield, it was called. And we, all the seniors had the opportunity or the option, if we wanted to, to play solos. The clarinet players or the saxophone players, trumpet players, whatever. All the seniors uh, were given the uh, option, if they wanted to do a solo for the senior band concert, which was in the spring of our graduation year. And so, of course, <laughs> I said, can I do Rhapsody of Blue? <laughs> and so I played Rhapsody in Blue with the high school band accompanying me. And I still have pictures somewhere. That's awesome. Of, and that's, and that. that's, a, that's, a, that's like, what, 10, 15 minutes long? That's a pretty long song. Yes, it is. About, it's specifically about 17, but you can also make cuts, and I think that's yeah. what we did. Okay. We did kind of cut little parts to make it a little shorter. Because you're right, that'd be too long for with everybody else playing. But I did that for my senior uh, senior high school uh, band concert and did that. Uh, so yes, but that was my introduction into playing jazz. And so I, by that time, I was already playing with the high school uh, big band, you know, right. the jazz band. So I'd already gotten to do that. And by that time, I was already starting to write songs. Um, in fact, high school was the time where I started writing. Um, I actually wrote my Actually, I'm going to back up just a couple of years in middle okay. school. Uh, we called it intermediate school. When the eighth grade, we had a brand new um, intermediate, or we would call it middle school today. Uh, the school had just been opened. And so, now that, again, I'm, yeah, I was 13 because it was eighth grade. They had a contest. And they said, this is a songwriting concert. We need someone to write a school song because it's a brand new school. Right. And so there were a lot of several kids do that, you know, and I did. I wrote mine, and I still have it. And it was the alma mater, and it won. No <laughs> so kidding. I won the, contest, won the contest with that, and uh, and I wrote. Yeah, anyway, so I started then, and then when I got to high school a couple of years later, when I'm fifteen, yes, when I'm fifteen, two years later, right. Um. Um. This friend of mine, who actually was the opera, she she sang opera. She's the one I mentioned that did Madame Butterfly. She's mm -hmm. a very talented girl, and she was in the band with me. She played flute, and I played another instrument, played baritone horn. She was also a writer, as it turned out. So, she wrote the words for a proposed graduation song. We called it a part of life, and it was very sweet. And I still have it. And then I wrote the music to that. Well, son of the gun, we uh, got it performed. Got, okay, cool. And that that uh, they used to do that song. My sister also went to my same high school, and even after I graduated, they still played my song, uh, okay. the graduation song, "Part of Life." And so we did that. So I got to start doing a lot of writing, and then um, I'm sorry, I'm kind of talking. No, no, it's fun. I'm having. I'm, this is fun. You jump in, because then. 
<laughs> that was when I was 15. Then the next year, when I'm 16, um, I, uh, with a different classmate, uh, we wrote a Christmas song. And uh, a Christmas song, again, my classmate wrote the words and I wrote the music. In the beginning, I used to just put music to somebody else's words. Right. And so we did that, and it was called Christmas Comes But Once a Year. And that one has had quite a history because it's current now. It's a current history uh, because that song we did at my, uh, it was a high school, just as an assembly program, a Christmas assembly program. You know how schools, they get together. And, right, right. And so we did our chorus and band. They would do different Christmas songs, blah, 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 blah. And so um, the chorus teachers heard our song, liked it. And in the first year when we're juniors, and you have to bear in mind, this was uh, only a few weeks beforehand. We had just written this song and the pro Christmas program was coming up. And the, but the teacher liked it. So we did it in front of the student body, just she and he, just me on the piano and she was singing it. And my sister was in the audience because my sister was a freshman this year, that right. year. And I will say in all humility, <laughs> That was a most moving experience because we finished the song and the whole student body gave us a standing ovation. What do you want? You want to, you want to play it? Okay. You still, you yeah. still remember it? And by the way, oh, oh, I certainly remember it because what I was about to say was I have done a full orchestration of that and I just had it on just before the Christmas holidays. I put it on Facebook, so it was actually well, even even Facebook. even better. Let's let's hear it. Let's hear it. Uh oh, you mean hear that recording? Well, no, or you can play it if you want to. Actually, you know what? Because I can, because if it's on Facebook, I can link to it. Uh, you know, Perhaps later. you can find files here. Okay. Uh, if I can, if I can grab it real quick, uh, this was here. I'm gonna move to it. I'm just you just keep talking while I'm. Okay. Looking. Okay. Are you are you gonna? I mean, I know it, do you I have do you is. have the the setup to be able to play that over over Zoom to play the file? Let's over see Zoom? what happens. All right. Uh, let's let's find out. If it doesn't if it doesn't work, I'll do it live. Okay. But, but I do have a, uh, let's see here, okay. Um, there we go. I'm trying to find the track. Uh, okay. I hate having to look for files. I do too. And actually, I have a lot of music files, but I also have, uh, it was a video, is what I did. I'm, I'm going to show here. I'm going to do it one more time. So just you just keep talking. You can ask me questions. I can answer okay. as you go. You do, do uh, several things at once. Um, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I must admit that half the reason I wanted to do this uh, do this interview with you is because it's been a while since I've heard you play. I used to come by uh, come by the apartment, and you and Mom would just spontaneously, you know, play a song, sing a song, and I kind of miss that. Well, in fact, I'm pretty sure your mom. Uh, knows knew this song because uh, one of my stu for, students at the time uh, sang it okay. at a program, and uh, here we go. I'm finding it right. Here, I'm just doing videos. Oh, here we go. Here All we right, go. Well, here we go. Uh, I think I found the video. Okay. Open file location. Okay. Up, ah, up, ah, up. Ah. Here we go. Now I'm going to see if this works. Do you hear that at all? I, I can hear it. Yeah. It's a little quiet. Is it coming out of your speakers? Yeah. Hang on, just a second, because okay. this is where Zoom. I've learned this about Zoom, by the way. We have something called we share share screen. Okay. I don't know. But if I... you can't. I would. Uh, yeah. Except you. Uh, you would have to make me the host to do it. Host disabled participant screen sharing. Okay, but. So you can't really share the screen, though, can you? You can't let me share the screen for a moment, can you? I'm not. I'm not sure. I don't uh, because I have it formatted. Uh, so yes, if I that, share that's this. right. That's okay. I don't want to waste any more time right now. But uh, basically, um, here Christmas comes. That's video here. One more time. Um, the history behind this, like I say, I had written that back in high school and have had it sung with a couple of choir groups around here, and then at various cabarets, I've actually done it um, in cabaret shows. Here we go. Here we go. Now, this is, this is the audio, and let me know if you can hear it. Okay. 
Yeah, I can. It's, can a little, it? it's a little soft, but I can hear it. I can bring it up. Yeah. Better? Yeah. You can talk about the summer and the rest, but the season that is really best of all is Christmas with its cheer and joy as we all remember the times that will live in our hearts. It comes once a year and how we can feel the magic that Christmas is bringing. Yeah, there's a little bit of feedback on it. Once a year. How's that? Better? Holly yeah, a little bit, yeah. And the feeling of good cheer. And so you wrote this in high school, but you did the arrangement. The orchestration I did this year. Okay. Just a few months ago. Okay. You know, you've got so much. You've got so much music uh, that you've done. We gotta, we gotta set you up with your own YouTube channel to just to, to showcase everything that you've done. The singer in this is a former student of mine. It was uh, I've known for 20 years, and her name is Linnell Johnson. Okay. But this was written when I was 16. You know, you know what I should have done. So these these are all we're we're doing this all you know spontaneous with no with no prep. Exactly. And what no I sh prep. what I should have done was I should have added uh, added an extra audio track and had had your music just playing in the background real soft while we were talking have kind of like background lounge music, like a couple people hanging out in a bar and... Right. Actually, I wonder if we could, we could try that next time. Okay, it's short. The song is not that long. Good voice. Oh, she's marvelous. Yeah, no, she's great. I'm feeling so divine, so easy to remember the stockings on the wall, little children smiling. Yeah, we need yeah, to it, we need to get a better yeah. It, it, it came up through a little staticky through the through the microphone, but we can. Uh, I yeah. bet I, there's got to be a way that we could set this up to have like a musical medley in the background. Well, and... actually, I, I think I may have mentioned I do Zoom uh, classes, and right. so when you host it, you can actually control the computer. It goes through. Computer oh, okay, stuff. okay. So that's why I was asking about that. But anyway, I didn't mean to. <laughs> no, no, no. That's it's, 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 it's interesting me about that. No, no, but, it's, so, it's interesting. I like it. And by the way, the and I do a lot of orchestration. I started doing that when I was actually in college. Right. Uh, writing for the college bands and things like this. And in recent years, because of technology, uh, that was a that was not a real orchestra, by the way. That was actually that was a, a digital computer. orchestra. Digital orchestra. Now, did, right. did you do that through? Did you do that through through Tom's studio, or is this? Well, you did this. This is just on your computer that you did that, right? This is through a program. Uh, it's a software program called Finale, which many okay. Broadway shows have used, and many professionals have used. And so, but I can digitally, I can choose the violins, the strings, the brass, the drums, right. whatever. And so, basically, I, I, and I do a lot of arranging. That's another element of what I've done over the years is doing a lot of orchestrations with different singers, and that's what that was. Um, so, but the orchestration I did, and just going through, like I say, the journeyman type of thing we talked about earlier. Wow. When, I went, when I went to college, which was in Nashville, Tennessee, I uh, actually was in the chorus and the band. And when I was in the band, I did write uh, some different 
arrangements and compositions that was that were played by the band uh, there. And even after I graduated, they played a couple of my uh, orchestrations. So I, I always loved that. It kind of, in a way, I didn't ever stop writing original songs, but I, I kind of it kind of went uh, a little less. So I would build up more orchestrations. You're, you're doing more to... orchestrations now and less less original. Music well, or? yeah. For the well, yeah. I mean, the, uh, in the in the high school and college and few years after that, I did a lot of original writing. Uh, but then, while I was in college itself, it's when I started writing several band arrangements. Now, weren't that many, maybe five or six or so forth, uh, because that was really such a, a thrill to write something that you hear your composition being played by a full ensemble. That's always right. a good thrill to do that type of thing. So, so after after the uh, after after the cruise that you and mom were on, I know that you two would do a lot of gigs together, uh -huh. and, and yep. you you guys performed everywhere. Uh, and and uh, I I seem to recall a story that uh, that uh, I, I I guess it was in New York that you guys where you two uh, performed for uh, for a certain uh, retired president. <laughs> didn't didn't uh, didn't you uh, didn't you guys? Uh, yes, we did. You, you were at a you were at a party. I I, I think that uh, that a bunch of people just happened to be there, right? Or what, tell me the story on that. I can't remember the exact occasion, but it was a uh, I don't know whether it was literary or whatever. But yes, he and his wife were there as, as featured speakers, right? And we provided a, a few minutes of entertainment, that kind of thing. And, and actually, that was pretty common. I used to do a lot of that with different people. Sometimes you have big banquets and you have big things, and that's kind of common in our business. Uh, even when I was doing with Duchin, we used to do parties, and then they would have speeches later and so forth and so on. But your mom and I did perform for that. And I'm pretty sure, again, we're talking a long time ago, that we probably did our usual things. In other words, West Side Story and, right. and the musical theater. We didn't do as much opera in functions like this because let's face it opera is kind of a specific thing uh that works in some scenarios but the average person is not really familiar well, and also with you need the you need the right uh you need the right environment uh for it as right. well like we uh we were at uh when i was in college we were uh, mom was uh mom was visiting and there's this italian restaurant that i was working at and uh and the uh, the owner victor uh, you know, knew that mom was an opera singer and he wouldn't feed us right. until mom sang. And right. so she was, she was, uh, you know, she was singing, uh, you know, singing opera. Uh, she's doing La Traviata in this little tiny Italian restaurant. And, and it was just, it was so powerful, but I don't uh, know the acoustics weren't was, right for it in there. Well, I don't know if it's the same one, but I don't know if you recall, there was a restaurant like that Italian restaurant, not too far from where your apartment was. Uh, it was just across the street on I want to say seventy. No, yeah, no, no, no. The, the the one I'm talking about was here in Oklahoma. But yeah, there's another. There's oh, another okay. one in. Sorry, yeah, no, there's another one in New York, and that was a good place too. Yeah, and so you're right. But in venues like this, because if it's run by Italian, uh, if they had ten restaurants, they're more into opera. But right. the average, uh, the average banquet. Let's face it, musical theater is always the the, you know. The go it's, it's the safe bet because everybody likes musical yeah. theater in those circles. And they're, and they're familiar with songs yeah. and things like West Side Story, Showboat, were songs that uh, have been around for so many years that they're everybody's familiar with it. So people appreciate that more. And plus the fact, I, it's it's in English because uh, with opera, most opera is sung in different languages, especially Italian. Right. So so uh, that's why it always works very nicely in Italian restaurants, whereas in uh, other situations. People not going to really be as familiar with opera as they would be with musical theater. So. Well, and, and I've and I've been to a number of these of these these events, and and what I, what always kind of struck me is that people who'd be just vehemently arguing with each other on TV or just getting drinking and being buddies when when the cameras aren't on. And and have you noticed yeah. the same thing? Or oh sure, yeah. So because oh, sure. everybody's just chill when when uh, when they're not being paid to to yell at each other. Could you could you do some West Side Story for us? Well, let's see. Of course, some of the songs were actually more for her. Uh, well, you could play. But the one that comes to mind that was always the guy's song. Right. Was, uh, Maria. I've just met a girl named Maria. 
And suddenly I found how wonderful a sound can be. Maria, I've just kissed a girl named Maria. And suddenly I found how wonderful a sound can be. Maria, say it loud and there's music playing. Say it soft and it's almost like praying. Maria, I'll never stop saying Maria. Wonderful, and there wonderful. Were, there were, of course, things like uh, West, uh, uh, the, the most familiar one was uh, Tonight, which is in the show, is done as a duet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a, that you you do uh, you have that one in that video that you that you and mom uh, put up uh, from that cruise right. yeah yeah no I well, love and, that and we tried to imitate the way it's done in the show so for example she would sing I feel pretty for obvious reasons I right. wouldn't sing that. <laughs> <laughs> we'd look at you funny if you did <laughs> don't get me started I have a story about that song with a oh, guy oh no <laughs> let's <laughs> tell you that's <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and then I would do things like uh, G Officer Krupke, I think maybe I didn't do that one in that medley. No, but wasn't it? Were... I loved that song when I was a little kid, though. I always thought it was funny. Tonight, tonight won't be just any night, and it's a really lovely duet uh, as done in the in the musical play and the and the movie. I mean, everybody remembers the movie, and so that was done like that. Um, but yeah, your mom and I used to do that. And Showboat was another one. And for those of people who don't know Showboat, one song that comes to mind that I always did was Old Man River, that Old Man River, which is a classic bass song. Yeah. Like bass. yeah. And on the other hand, your mom would do uh, We Could Make Believe I Love You, which is a very lovely. Yeah, no, uh, she duet. loved that one. Yeah the two characters and and uh, and we also did why do i love you why do you love me which is another great song it's a great show for uh, uh, for the voice like your mom had it was a, a great soprano uh, role for that so there was some beautiful songs in that uh uh life upon the wicked stage and different things so we used to have fun with those little medleys and and do that so uh so what? So what have you? Uh, so what have you been up to recently? Because with with the uh, with kind of the current situation that we're in, you can't uh, you can't really perform so much. And you told me you're doing a lot of classes over the internet. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, yeah, yeah, that's true. At, for the last, actually, for to back up a little bit, in the last 25 years or more, I worked for a, uh, I still do actually, for the American Musical Dramatic Academy which is a musical theater school in Manhattan, working in various capacities, vocal coach, piano accompanist, uh, sight singing teacher at one point, things like this. It's a basically musical theater school. Right. And so obviously with the virus situation, uh, with everything having to shut down and so forth, everybody's kind of like, what do we do? What do we do? And as many schools have had to do, they've had to do many online classes. Now in music, it's really tricky, especially singing and playing piano because of our delay, the techno technological delay. You can't really play. What I'm doing is easy because I'm doing the same thing at the same time. But if there's a singer on Zoom, I cannot play with them at the same time. There's going to be about a half second, quarter second delay. Exactly. And that's why it's difficult. But uh, I still do the lessons. I'll explain how that works is basically we've had to all go online. So with that happening and no performing, which has really devastated vast amounts of our community, uh, because I know people who perform, but they don't really teach or they either don't have the background or they don't have the patience or whatever. So it's really devastated our community. I was scheduled to do shows last year. Uh, and then the virus hit. Well, and, we and, and if you're, and if you're studying music, you still need to develop that stage presence, otherwise... Uh... Well, and, yeah, what they do, at least in the school, like I was telling you about a moment ago, they still have the classes. Uh, the difference is, because they're online, you, and the teaching is one thing. So you can have a, a theater teacher, so you do this, you do this. And how we do it, by the way, is mm -hmm. the pianist, in this case me, would record the tracks. And, and, then, they'd sing, and then they'd sing to the tracks. Yes, exactly. So, so it's I, all so, done on tracks. So I was uh, in in the last uh, in the last episode. I was talking to uh, to Tom Sponge. I don't know if you knew him very well or not. 
Yeah. You, you, you know Tom, right? Yeah. So yeah. anyway, yeah. so what he was telling me is that uh, that when Mom was uh, when they were doing the digital orchestra, uh, Mom would be singing, and then Celeste would be real time conducting the orchestra with some sort of a a tap system where she would yes. then pace the orchestra to match Mom, because yeah. in uh, I guess in opera, you don't have that that steady tempo that you would have. Uh, perhaps in show tunes, and so you can't, right. uh, so you can't just have that. You know, you don't have that steady rhythm. Well, singing to tracks is always problematic. I have a number of private students, and when when I've done this, yes, I've actually had to record the tracks so they use them during the lesson. But that means the singer is forced to sing to the track, and if you're doing rubato, uh, rubato, by the way, is a, is a term, a musical term, which means it has fluidity. The, right. The, 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 you can slow down. You can speed right. You, up. You do. A you do a lot of that uh, in in your performances. Well, I've and the, the whole point, like for example, with your mom, and if your if your mom or any singer uh, wants to kind of take their time and whatever, well, the, the professional pianist or accompanist will be able to follow that singer, and that's fine. In live performance, it's easy. The problem in tracks, which is what we're forced to doing right now, you can't do that. You literally have to. I literally have to kind of guess where those places are. And then I, in actually in the lessons, part of my lesson teaching in private lessons on Zoom, is to teach them how to work with a track. In right. other words, you have to. If it's a steady tempo, is easy. But not mo most songs, even musical theater, you're going to have some places that you have to slow down a little bit. You know, so they have to learn to sing with a track. I mean, it, the whole business is totally upended because we've had to force ourselves to really learn some new skills and we really miss the performing, but that's how we do it. And I am doing a lot uh, through that. Um, what I primarily do besides the school, in fact, most of what I do with the school is really just recording. And I send right. that in, okay. I, I can do that at home. And, but I also work with private lessons uh, also online with a bunch of elementary school kids now. Most of them are Chinese kids and that's another story altogether. Uh, but I, I, are you so so like they're in they're in China and you're and you're well, uh, no, I say Chinese I mean Chinese American okay people. so they're so they're here okay they live here however I have just in, in recent uh, few weeks have started doing some classes with kids in China uh, which is problematic for a different reason because it's the 13 hour time difference yeah yeah so for example one of my new students is in Shanghai and it's a young 12-year-old girl, which uh, I was able to meet through a contact I have in Shanghai. It's one of their students. And so I have to do a 7 a.m. class here. Right, because that'll which, be 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. for them. 8 p.m. for them. So it's a 13-hour difference. Right, because you're, yeah, because, uh, okay. And then the other night, Saturday night, I had to do an 8.30 at night class uh, because the kids, which were like 6-year-olds. 7.30 were, in the morning. Well, no, it'd be or nine thirty uh, in the morning. Yeah, morning there. So, it's a it's problematic because of the time difference. But they're kind of fun, and it's a little different for me because over the years, most of my work has been with older. You know, we're talking about trained, you know, at least high school, mostly college age and older. And in only recent years, uh, before the virus hit, before we had to do lockdowns, I started doing some workshops in China, uh, in 2019, in Taiwan and Chengdu with little kids okay. <laughs> as old as young as four or five years old and uh, which is a, another challenge because most of them don't speak english over there they do here because they were born here most right of them. so we have translators so it's, it's interesting the number of uh, experiences that i've had to now, deal with now why now why are they wanting a why are they wanting an american uh musical coach uh when this the... Well, this is interesting because this all started back in 2013, and actually it started before then. About 20 years ago, I had a student here at the American Music, my, the school I just mentioned a little while ago, AMDA, and uh, one of my students that I played for in her uh, played her class was from Taiwan. Okay. And which is interesting, we have students from all over the world, and so uh, it's very talented opera background and so forth, and she was learning about musical theater. She was a teacher actually in Taiwan. So she was actually, she was actually an older student, and so she came to America to learn about musical theater, so she could then take it back to Taiwan, which is eventually what she did. Okay, because they don't have those. Yeah. They don't have 
because their their musical theater to be completely different from ours, I suppose. Well, it's it's they know about it, but they it's limited. Okay. Okay. You know, they they know some of the things you see on TV and and the movie, whatever. You know, it's very limited their knowledge of musical theater. At least it was then. That was in 2000, and so in 2000, she and I kept in touch even after she went back to Taiwan. And so in the summer, in the spring of 2013, because we've been talking about this idea for a long time, I would, she said, oh, we'd love to do a workshop and have people from America come over to Taiwan and teach us more about musical theater. I said, well, that's nice. We've been talking about that for a few years. And then so, uh, spring of 2013, she says, I found a company in Taiwan that wants to do this. I said, really? And so she said, can you recommend a voice teacher? Can you recommend an acting teacher? So I found two teachers from my school and she, they booked us, they paid our flights, they paid our salary. And we did a one week work or two weeks of workshops in Taiwan, okay. teaching, okay. teaching them about musical theater. That was in 2013. We did that again in 2014 and then 15 and then in 16 and, and so forth and so on uh, up until the, until the until the until pandemic until, okay and so basically there was a thirst that they had because we had students also coming from taiwan in the interim so every time we had new students from taiwan coming to our school in new york and then they would go back you have more and more it just becomes more and more popular because they know more information right they have all this type of thing now how china got involved in that was in 2005 15 not only did we do taiwan but we had the opportunity to do workshops in shanghai and beijing okay it it's actually worse there because um because there are some restrictions that china has that taiwan doesn't because taiwan is a you know a democracy and and they have more access to internet things than uh Right. They do in China. It's a totally different you know, thing that they do, and so uh, they didn't. They did. They know even less. Not only that, but in Taiwan, at least, a lot of English was spoken by a lot of the students, so there was more prevalent. Taiwan, not so much. I mean, excuse me, uh, China, not so much. So when we went there, we definitely had to have translators, and some of them did have some access to very few things, Les Miserables. Or a few things, it's just very limited. So you're really kind so, of starting from scratch. Pretty close, because that was why they sent us over there, is to have American teachers teach Chinese uh, people, because they was right. Teach them, teach American show tunes. Well, and not only that, but look what's happened also in pop things in recent years. Now they have Asia's Got Talent, and they have right. The Voice, and things like this. So. American pop culture has drifted over there in many respects in musical theater and pop culture and everything, and pop songs as well. So there has been a thirst for that. One thing I've discovered about China, even though it has a different form of government, um, they also have a lot of uh, basically, you know, capitalism going over there with the stores. And they, they are certainly a thought. The only thing we found that was different in China is because since it has a very ultra conservative values in that regard they they are very restricted about what songs for example we could not do the show rent over there any songs from rent yeah yeah rent would probably drive because rent is uh about uh, some very interesting characters yeah and and some lifestyles and things yeah, like that this. they would probably not approve of in china yeah yeah whereas in taiwan it wasn't a problem you could do things like that in taiwan much easier because of the it's more right because it's culturally a little bit different there yeah Exactly. So there were some restrictions. So basically, we we taught them a lot of the most more traditional uh, musical theater, things like, you know, Showboat or West Side Story, things like this. So there's a lot of things that they were fine to do. So that was the only restriction. But one thing I found in both situations, both in Taiwan and China, and I think people who know about the Asian culture will, will know this, is they're very disciplined and they're also very respectful. And they are they do their homework. They're very dedicated to the arts, especially in music. Um, many of them start piano and, and other things, violin, when they're five years old. Yeah, they they just power through it. They don't they're they're very serious power about through. it from what I've seen. Yeah. Very very serious. I mean we had situations in workshops, you don't have much time. You have maybe five days of a workshop and sometimes we'll say, Well, that song's not right for you. Let's try another song. So we'll give them a new song and and they would have it learned by the next day, in one day. And it wasn't even their language. Yeah. Not their original language. So I said, wow. <laughs> I said, 
I want to take you guys back to America. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no kidding. And teach our American students that kind of discipline. And so I, I've, I've kind of been wedded to that. And so that's kind of followed. That's the backstory to what I'm now doing because I'm working primarily with a couple of different Chinese schools. Mostly these are young kids and they are mostly located, you know, in New York and, and this area, but uh, to teach them about musical theater. In fact, one of the classes is even called Broadway singing for kids. Right. So, so it's, it's kind of their background. It's very different teaching children though. And boy, does it exhaust me sometimes. <laughs> Well, you look it's, like you still have quite a bit of energy. You are always uh, you are always quite energetic when I. I think it's the kids keeping. They, they make they force me to. <laughs> they force me to have some energy. Force you to chase them around the internet. Keep on top of them. Yeah. Well, it, it's it would be hard enough in person, but imagine doing this on Zoom. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so I say, because they're usually in their chairs or sometimes even on their own beds. I said, you have to stand up if you have to sing. Blah blah blah. And then sometimes it's, oh, can I go to the bathroom? <laughs> said, Come back. Come back. It's your turn to sing. <laughs> now, do you have more than one kid at once? Or are you doing a whole bunch of kids? Or Well, that's what I'm saying. We have group classes. Right, we okay. Group classes, you really can't effectively have more than about six or eight at a time. I did have one class a year or so back when we had 12. And, uh, and that was nuts. Is it, is it just the limitation in the technology, or is it just because they're too hard to manage once you have too many of them? It wasn't really limitations. It was that was the second one. It was yeah. the more yeah. difficult to manage because when you're in a group class and you have only have one hour and you're trying to teach a song, that means you don't have much time with each kid. Yeah. If I'm trying to teach them getting to know you, getting to know you, you know, you have to do it little by little, and by the time you go to get to the twelfth kid, you may have only gotten like one line of the song or two lines of the song. So it's very difficult. I do one-on-one, -on -one, which is much easier to do. It's always easier to do one-on-one -on -one because you can spend more time with that one person. Um, and, and I teach them about tracks and these kids are actually pretty smart. They know how to control the microphone on Zoom and they know even how to do the share screen, which they shouldn't do because, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Well, these, I've, these, I've noticed that little kids seem smart. to, little kids when they're growing up around the technology, they just, they just dive right in. Well, and they, you know how Zoom has these backgrounds? These, these, yeah. uh, they know how to do that. I wish they didn't. <laughs> Sometimes they're in outer space or they're in Hawaii. <laughs> or, 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 you know the backgrounds I'm talking about, right? They yeah. have those backgrounds. <laughs> so, and they put on the mustaches and things like that. Stop! Stop! We have to do music class. <laughs> Not comedy class. Uh, but they're dedicated. You know, and they actually do work from time to time. Some don't. Some do. It's like any class, you know, any age. Uh, some work, some don't. It's just that when they're young. And, you know, I kind of feel for the kids because you, have, you probably see a lot of news reports about uh, the pros and cons of online teaching. And there really are. Most yeah. of them, unfortunately, are, are cons because it's very hard. Can you imagine teaching any kind of class, not just music, but any other classes? It's very difficult uh, to do online teaching, and that's why a lot of people want to get back to in-person teaching, which I totally agree with. Um, but at least in the area, room, we can do it. At least we can keep the yeah. going. Well, and I think it depends on the subject as well. So, like, if you're, yes. uh, if you're learning, like, history or English or something where it's a lot of uh, I know that when I was in college, there were a lot of classes that uh, I was doing a uh, independent research class. Uh, I was doing uh, where I was doing uh, my graduate uh, space station design class, and I didn't have to. Ha the interactions that I had with the professor, you know, we didn't have the internet technology quite like we have now. But if I had the modern technology, I could have totally done that class online because I only had to meet with the professor once every couple of weeks to show him where we were going, and we did a lot of stuff over the phone just talking, and, and so it would have been easier if I could show him, hey, this is what I'm working on, this is where I'm thinking, and so something like that, sure, but like a lab class or you know, where you have to have hands-on stuff, that's very hard, or yeah. a musical class like you know, I don't, you know, with, with, the, with the delays, like getting a choir together to all sing together, that'd be a nightmare. That's 
Oh, it is. Uh, I have uh, I have a few students uh, actually on weekends. This is good. I like this because I work at a studio in Regal Park in Queens, which is kind of a ways out there. But about two and a half months ago, we started in-person teaching again. But we could do it there because they're like dance studios. There's a lot of space. So they, we still wear the masks. We still all do that kind of thing. And even though we have that restriction, it's so nice to be able to have the student in the same room with you, even if you're six feet apart or whatever. At least it's great to have them in person. And right, I can right. Play for them. I can play for them alive without worrying about delays and all that kind of thing. And uh, Well, and even I when would... mom was doing her recording stuff, she'd be in the recording booth, which was totally isolated from, you know, where, from where Tom and Celeste were. And so you could do right. situations like that, too. So it's very, very good to do that. But uh, the reason I was saying that is one of my students who's 16 now, I've been teaching for a year, we're doing opera. And uh, my goodness, uh, it kind of reminded me of your mom because she's now doing, uh, I started her with music theater. I could have danced all night. And now she's doing Puccini, <laughs> and which I'm really proud of her. But we had a little conversation the other day because she's doing her online classes, you know, like a lot of them are. And she said, she told me she had a music class. And I said, how's that going? And she did. <laughs> yeah. I said, don't they do anything? They don't do anything. <laughs> this girl's very smart. She actually was born in China and has only been in, from Beijing and has only been in the U.S. for maybe five years. But her English is, is flawless. Right. <laughs> and uh, But she said, they don't really do anything. <laughs> and it's kind of sad to hear that because you're right you can't do a choir very easily it's the same problem uh, if when i do a zoom class there are times i want them to all sing at the same time but how i you, did that one <laughs> i yeah. tried that once and I, like there's a even with them there it's, it's not all you can't do it you can't do it uh, but with technology there are some editors that are able to put these all together after the fact which is fine you know and i've actually participated in some of that well, and I know, uh, I know there's a, so I, I have friends who have done like Zoom concerts where they'll, you know, they've got, uh, I guess they've got their headphones, they're all playing the track at the same time, and then they're, then they're doing their part, you know, into the microphone, and they get it, you know, close, it's, it's rock and roll, and it's close enough, and... Although my but, feeling is they don't do it live. No, they, they they these guys were trying to do it. They were they were trying to do it live. They got it better. Than, it was it, it was better than nothing. You know, it was better than nothing. Yeah, but, but you, uh, it's rough to do. Yeah, that. yeah. Well, I I did a, a group with a church group not too long ago, and what we would do is we would record our tracks separately, and then an editor would then put them. Yeah, together. no, I've seen I've seen a lot I've seen a lot of that happen. Yeah. So and then it's just it's, a matter of keeping the tempo, to, uh, keeping the tempo together. Well, and sometimes I would be the one providing the track, the tempo track, to, to make it do that. But then somebody would put all the vid all the videos together, and it looks like we're all at the same room at the same time. But in reality, we actually did it separately. So it's interesting. It's just it's like this. This is all stuff that we have to do now that you know we didn't have to do before, but at least it's doing something. Well, and I think that once all this is over, I think, I think that you know you're gonna. I think there's gonna be a thirst for live performances again, once we're able to do that. Well, see, I have a maybe a little. <laughs> yeah, you're not so sure about that. No, no, no. What I'm saying is, I think they've delayed it too long, honestly, because I'll tell you. If I say this, this is kind of going to more current. Uh, one of the singers I've been working with for a number of years is a lady named Adrian Hahn. She's from Germany. That's her home. But she comes back to New York. We've done shows for, we've worked together for 15, 17 years. And we we actually did China in 2019. We did about a 17 day tour. Uh, this summer, uh, she uh, was in Germany, of course, because of the, of the virus situ pandemic situation. And so she hired me to write orchestrations for about three of her shows. And they did live performances. And I said, well, how do they do that? I said, and then she would show me pictures. In the case of the big band, they'd use plexiglass between the musicians. Mm -hmm. And the, in the auditorium, which would normally seat 400 people, they only allowed 100 in. Okay. Okay. 
So you're doing the thing. You're, you're, you're making it work. And it is live, but they're doing the protocols. Great. And so, and, and then she did another one, uh, which was even a larger situation. Same situation. They had 50 musicians, but they separated and they did all this. And then Germany shut it down because they were so afraid of the virus spreading. Right. <laughs> but my point, what I was trying to say was my point is there are still ways to perform like she did if you do the smart things, you know, just to lock down everything. Um, I know theaters would be tricky, but to me, this is, again, just my opinion. It seems like if you just wait to bring up everything all at once, like in June, July or September, whatever they're talking about, it's going to be a while before audiences are already coming back because they're, you know, not in the mood to yet. If you start small is my point. Go to small theater situations. All right. Only allow a certain amount. Um, have the separations. People were concerned that singing, they'd spit onto the audience members in the front, which may be a reality. But so you don't put them in the front. You put them far enough back. Uh, when I do my in-person classes, that's what we do. You guys just, the stay, you just stay you know, far away from each other. And, yeah, like, well, act, yeah, because now it really it's hard to sing with a mask on. I will say that. It's, right, it's, right. It's stifling. But I keep my mask on. And I'm a good distance away. We've never had any issues, you know. Uh, so why can't theaters, at least small theaters, in some situations, let's say cabarets, just have, and I've done recording sessions recently, actually, out in Queens, where we're close together, but we're all wearing masks. And the, the singer's in the, like you say, in the booth and all that. And we're, I'm in the piano in the other room and things like that. And we're doing it just fine. And you can so, always get everybody tested beforehand and... You know, yeah. things like that. Of course, of course. I mean, and we do that. We take the precautions. We even clean the surfaces. We do the, uh, you know, hand sanitizer. My point is, I think there's so much fear is that people are afraid to just come back. And so there's, oh, we'll maybe do it in six months or nine months. And so, well, can we do it gradually? <laughs> That's my argument. Right, it's, right. I, it is, I, I can understand the fear. But I also think, because of these experiences, like with my friend in Germany and the experiences here, so I think we can work our way back gradually without just saying nothing at all. Because nothing at all means people are not working at all. Well, and you, and you might be able to try some, some test cases, you know, do a test case here, voluntary basis, sign waivers, and if it goes well, then maybe you do it again, then maybe... Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. sure there's a way to figure it out. It's just that people are reluctant to because of lawsuits. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you don't want to, you don't want to get somebody killed and and end up out of, and well, and, uh, and, well. Okay. okay. Well, don't, I want to get too. We we promise. Not yeah, to I don't, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to go down. I don't want to go down that route. But yeah, you yeah, got, right. you definitely have to get. You have, you definitely have to be careful. Yeah. Um. But uh, I would, I would imagine that there's a there there's there's got to be a way to 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 solve the problem. Of, of performances or like something something that we did uh you know early on uh you know my my neighbor is a rock and roll musician and mm -hmm. so we did a you know he did a show where he was sitting on his porch and we'd all be in our yards and and because of the amplifiers an outdoor show we could all hear you know around the you know around the block and it was no big deal we were all you know 40 50 feet away from each other um, sure. You know, we had just a big, uh, we just had kind of a big social distance block party yeah. where uh, everybody had their own, you know, had, were sitting on their porch with their burgers and their beers and, and well, uh, had a good old time. And we'd just yell at, recently. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, and we'd yell across the street to each other and, and you know. Well, actually, I was watching uh, uh, television not too long ago, actually Christmas time, and this was a current show. I believe it was in Nashville, if, if I'm not mistaken. There was a Christmas program with, with various performers of Broadway sing Broadway singers and people like that. I just lost my video there. There we go. Um, but there were various. You can still hear me, right? I yeah, I can, yeah, I can still hear you. We're fine. Uh, but it was a uh, it was a filmed concert, a Christmas concert, and I'm pretty sure it was Nashville because it was outdoors. It right. had to be someplace warm. Could have been Florida. But the point is, there was a Christmas concert. Uh, with a lot of these uh, uh, Norm Lewis and various famous uh, Broadway singers singing all these Christmas songs. And the band 
were all wearing masks. This was outside. Yeah. The singers, the soul singers, and you could see the separation and all that. Good. <laughs> well, and you could you could have the band all wearing masks, or, and you could have the uh, the singer could quarantine for the two weeks or whatever whatever the number is, uh, and and maybe uh, and maybe work a solution, you know, and like I, that. And, and I also saw uh, almost around the same time, I saw another. Uh, I think it was Jeff Dunham, the ventriloquist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I heard of him. Pretty sure, again, it was either Nashville or somewhere warm. Let's put it that way. <laughs> because it was obviously out. It was outside. And you could see the audience members wearing masks. Their seats were kind of separated. Or spaced out, yeah. Spaced out. So that's kind of my issue. That's my point, is they're doing that now. But the sad thing is in New York, because of the you know proximity everybody has and the un- Fortunate, you know. Well, there, there's it's a, it's a lot it's a lot more dense in New York, and it's hard to, you know, everybody dense, has to take the subway. Dense. You know, here in Oklahoma, and one, and one of the reasons I decided to to wait this thing out here is because there's lots of space. There's not many people. I don't have right, to. Right. I mean, hell, even when I go to the grocery store, I don't ever get within 30, 40 feet of anybody until I check out. Right. Right. And uh, right. That's, you use the self checkout thing, and you're point. never near anybody. Well, and the, my point is, in a theater situation or in a situation like performing, like I was just describing, I mean, we're closer together at Walmart or in the grocery store than we are in doing these concerts. Because yeah. you, you're in many places, sometimes less than six feet away. You go to CVS, whatever the case may be, or you go to a liquor store or whatever. So the point is that I think it's a shame that performers themselves don't have the opportunity to at least do cent- venues like what I've described. Um uh, it's right now it's a hard time because it's winter and especially right, but once it once it, it. Right, but once it warms up yeah you freeze your balls off in new york wait am i might yeah I yeah you can't do it now even restaurants have a hard time doing that yeah. but my point is that in warmer weather like those concerts i saw then you can certainly do that and she was able to do it in germany so i guess the point is we have to find ways to do it gradually because People are going to say in six months, what's worth it? It's not worth it. I want to, And so pe- people will go to Florida where it is warm and they could do things like that. Right, so, right. I mean, I'm, I'm tempted to leave New York myself for a while just to get to where I can perform in a warm place. Yeah, go down, go down to, yeah, go down to the Bahamas and perform outdoors. and. Yeah, and, and they are. And people yeah. are doing things like that in places like that. So it's, it's kind of frustrating to be a musician in this time. Uh, but teaching is something that you know keeps us going and you know doing all this well let's uh, maybe maybe we'll set you up a maybe we'll set you up a youtube channel start putting up all your music online or something we'll we'll figure i'll help you figure something out i think that'd be fun that would be kind of fun and uh, do that um i guess i've never really thought about that i have youtube videos on there right right about. yeah no cause, well because yeah. you're because uh, you you put you put mom's video up on youtube long before i even knew what youtube was i mean you're sort of you know right. that was that was uh that was a long time ago. Yeah, but... that was a video we had made that video actually after the cruise ship we did it over at Don't Tell Mama which is a cabaret room and we had it done professionally had a professional video done. Right. But well, I can't remember who it was. But in any case, so I used that video cuz we had a CD and I, I just was able to upload that to uh, YouTube and uh, use that and you may recall on YouTube I call it Remembrance yeah of christina deaver i think that's how i titled it uh because i wanted to show her on the even though it was both of us singing i wanted to yeah because you you put that up right after she had died yeah it was pretty soon after that yeah Yeah. it was after that and uh then there was a separate video which of a song that i wrote and that we used to do that i did on the cruise ship that we met uh and she introduces me on it okay hey i've got a i've got a question for you so something that Something that mom used to do, she was a little bit of a prankster, is she'd sometimes go to <laughs> she'd sometimes go to karaoke bars okay. and uh, and do and do show tunes. Were you ever part of any of that? I don't remember doing that with oh, her. Okay. I don't think I don't recall that. I've don't they've gone to karaoke's but I don't think she and I ever Yeah, cuz cuz mom was telling me that sometimes she'd get together with some of her some of her performer friends and they'd go Possibly, and yeah. and they'd go to a karaoke bar where nobody was just expecting anything at all, uh-huh, and and yeah. then you'd have you know just one after another just world class singers. Yeah. And I and, think I, I think I would have remembered that. Okay. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, because that would have been like, that would that would have been hilarious. Well, she uh, she she did that once in uh, you know in in college. You know, I was here in college, and she's like, "Hey, let's go to a karaoke bar." And, and I'm like, "I hate karaoke bars." Like, no, no, it's it's worth it. Let's go, let's go. And you know, I can't well, say no to mom. And so you know, she she'd get on. She start uh, she sang uh, uh, some sort of Celine Dion thing, I think. But uh, oh, okay. and right. and and everybody's like, you know, just amazed. And yeah. Uh, yeah, that the uh, well, I think one of the reasons your mom and I became such good friends is because I think we both discovered we were both pranksters. Yeah, I'm yeah. A I'm a jokester myself. You are, and you are. One thing musician, one thing everybody knows about musicians, at least many musicians, is we love musical jokes. So <laughs> we we used to have all these crazy musical jokes that we would tell. And uh, well, tell tell famous. us tell us a tell us a musical joke. Oh my goodness! Don't get me started. <laughs> You'll be here for another hour. <laughs> <laughs> One of the ones I used to tell was, "What's the uh, uh, what happens when you throw a piano down a mine shaft?" I have no idea. A flat minor, <laughs> and that's because oh. he didn't. Wait a minute, it's not done, and that's because he didn't see sharp. Oh no! <laughs> you see, they're bad. <laughs> they are pretty bad. Those are <laughs> they're pretty bad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or like, what's the difference between a violin and the viola? What What is the difference between a violin and a viola? The viola burns longer. <laughs> like I said, there's a lot of them out there. <laughs> well, <laughs> do you funny. want to uh, do you want to do you want to wrap this up with uh, with one more song? Yeah, actually, I would. And this is what I was just referring to a few minutes ago. Okay, uh, your mom. In the video, and your mom introduces me on the video because it was a song that I had written back in my mid-20s when I was still living in Alabama uh, teaching. But uh, I used to play it on the cruise ship, on that world cruise, every day because I had arranged it for the little band I had. And your mom, like everyone else, really loved it. And so when your mom and I did the video, she introduced me and she, if you go to the YouTube video, yeah, no, I think I think I know that song. Yeah, let's 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 hear it. It's called "Look Look of a Woman." Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. That's that's the one, and uh, all humility. They they seem to like it, so it's, it's, I play it all song. the time. So there we go. You can hear me, right? Yeah, I can yeah. hear you. And uh, the only history about this one is I wrote this originally in Alabama for a beauty contest. Interestingly enough, I was commissioned to do it for beauty contest. But ever since then, I've, you know, done many things. I've orchestrated this one as well. Uh, but this is dedicated to all the ladies. The look of a woman is a smiling face. Look of a woman is out of time and space. The look of a woman with all her shining hair is really something rare. How clean the breath of air when she's standing there. The look of a woman is a quiet thing. She whispers so gently, and things start happening. When she reaches out, and she touches my hand, I know she's a woman, a beautiful woman. For the look of a woman is you. of a woman is a quiet thing she whispers so gently and things start happening when she reaches out and she touches my hand i know she's a woman a beautiful woman for the look of a woman is you
Very good. Mm. Outstanding. Yeah, no, I remember that song. You do? Good. I, I do. No, I remember from the video, and I've, I've heard you play it before, too. Yeah, no, that's, that's good. Brings back some the memories. Video, if, if people go to the video, you have to be warned, I would look very young in that video. You don't, you don't look that different. You still, you still have all your hair, which is... Yeah, but the pounds are much more. Well, there's, there's just there's just more of you. Most of us have put on our COVID twenty or thirty. And, <laughs> oh well, yeah. I've had this weight for a little while, but oh, my point. Oh, well, actually, with, with this last couple of years, because we're we're inside all the time, I've gained about ten more point, pounds. But you know, you know, but anyway, yeah, that's that's been uh, very popular with many of my friends uh, over the years here in New York because I've done it with cabarets as well. But. Uh, and actually, it's 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 fitting also because we were talking about your mom, and you know, I wrote that song long before I met your mom. But you know, when you think about it, it's really it's kind of a dedication to all the women who have been very influential in our lives, our mothers, our sisters, um, wives, situations like that. That it kind of celebrates the glory of woman and what they do for us in our lives. And and I think of my mom. I even wrote a song earlier this year. Uh, when I think of the children, which is dedicated to mothers, basically a, a song for Mother's Day. And so that's why I, when I wrote that in, in this beauty contest, that's the reason for that. So anytime I have an audience of women out there, I always dedicate it to and them. I, and I bet that's a hit, yeah. I dedicate it to them. Well, we should we should definitely do this again. This is a lot of fun. This brought back some memories, and this is and this is why I'm trying to do this this uh, this video series just to you know as a way to interact with all of all of my friends, all the people that that influenced me when I was a child, and right. and a lot of the uh, you know just interesting people that I've run into, well, and you, and uh, no, you you were you were your big your big influence on me. And uh, well, I've, I've always enjoyed w being with your family, and Bob was always so your dad. Bob was always so supportive. He was always there, promoting your your mom. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And he uh, he had a you know the you know the the story the story that Dad told me is that he uh, when he was younger he was a real fan of music he loved music he was always working on tinkering to get the best recording equipment the best audio equipment and all that he just and he could never get it quite as good as a live performance and uh, he just yeah. and he just couldn't figure out the a way to get you know to get that quality yeah. of 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 music and right, so right. he had to do the next best thing which was marry an opera singer. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> that way, he, that way he could nope. get all the live music he wanted. Oh my goodness, that's true. Yeah. Well, you know, and I've, I've always drifted. To, um, my best friendships have been with women who are in the field, you know, uh, because we have that camaraderie. We know what we kind of know how each other thinks, and that's that's nice. You can have a because uh, I've I've worked with many women and singers over the years, and. That's what I appreciate. That well, it's having having that. a good team to perform with, having a good accompanist, or having a good uh, good co-star, you have to at least from my observations. Not that I not that I perform or anything, but it seems that the people can really play off each other and have that real good interaction. You can always tell the people that yeah. like performing with each other rather than the people who are just there for the paycheck. Well, in my case too, I was I had a little bit of an advantage. In fact, I'm also a singer. Yeah, because. Yeah. There's a lot of great pianists who play for singers, but they don't sing themselves. But I was singing from an early age, and I always loved to sing. But I kind of like, not that I'm like Michael Feinstein, but it's like what Michael Feinstein does. Uh, it's the same thing as singing pianist, and that's what uh, I made you know, a lot of uh, my income from, was playing singing pianist gigs. And that's what I did on the cruise ship, actually, uh, was that singing piano skill. And so singing with another singer is always much more fun than just singing by myself. Yeah, I always I, I always wanted to do the singing pianist thing, but I find that, well, first off, I'm not that great of a pianist, um, and I certainly am out, am out of practice, but what I found was that um, if, I'm, if I'm singing and if I'm playing, I can do one or I can do the other, but I can't do them both. Yes, and that's I right. spent I spent a lot of time in college trying to learn how to do... Uh, uh, how to do like cats and and phantom and stuff like that, and right. eventually I just gave up on the piano because it's like you know what I can't play and sing at the same time, and I'll never be good enough to play Gershwin, so screw it, I'll stick <laughs> with singing and and wrestling. And, well, there's uh, there, there are tricks to the trade. You don't yeah. have to play as much when you sing because you play mostly chords, right? <laughs> background, so it's not like you have to do the whole Rhapsody in Blue while you're singing. So. 
Well, I mean, I guess you don't really technically sing Rhapsody in Blue because there's no <laughs> there's That's no true. lyrics to it, but uh... well, we'll make up some. We'll have to make up some. <laughs> All right. Daddy. Okay, Mark. Well, this is great. I appreciate this. It was a, kind of a sudden thing. Uh... Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you took my call. Yeah, no, this is just uh, this is my fourth episode. Uh, you know, I I got started doing a couple conversations with my dad because dad has you know dad and I talk every night for like an hour anyway, so we. Uh, you know, we, we we started talking about maybe recording, and Dad has a lot of ideas and notes for things that he's wanted to yep. talk about over the years. And then I was like, you know what? I know a lot of interesting people. Let's start calling them up and seeing if I can get them on video. And uh, good. Good. and so uh, no, this has been this has been good. So we'll do this. We'll do this again, hopefully, and and okay. uh, we'll get you to play some more music. I hope everybody likes this. And I'm going to do a little closing now. So uh, just a reminder to everybody, if you like the video, if you like what I'm doing, please subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends, like the video, all that stuff that makes YouTube like me a little bit better. And, uh, and uh, let's, let's do this again. Thank you for watching. Everybody, good night. <laughs>